Hi, my name is Dean Aliotto, and I am the filmmaker of UFO Abduction and Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County, a.k.a. the McPherson Tape, and you are on VHS shit. <laughs> <laughs> Com a disseminação da videocassete, os anos 80 e 90 foram prolíferos na criação de mitos e lendas on tape, como discos voadores, extraterrestres, fantasmas e o arquiteto Taveira. Um desses casos aconteceu precisamente no início dos anos 90, quando nos Estados Unidos começou a circular de mão em mão, entre entusiastas do fenómeno OVNI, uma afamada videocassete caseira que continha aquilo que parecia ser o registro de um encontro imediato de uma pacata família em casa com invasores extraterrestres. A gravação com pouco mais de uma hora, apesar de duvidosa, foi suficientemente credível para deixar em alvoroço uma série de gente, incluindo, pasme-se, altas patentes da Força Aérea Americana que se apressaram a tentar desmistificar o vídeo. E é aqui que chegamos ao criador daquele que é provavelmente o primeiro e completo falso vídeo amador da história, ou found footage. Ele chama-se Dean Aliotto, é hoje nosso convidado, Uh, e não tarda vai-nos contar como diabo é que acidentalmente este vídeo se tornou um perdido e achado e como é que mais tarde realizou ele próprio um remake do mesmo para a televisão. Uh, e julgo que é aqui que a nossa história começa com nós dois, Paulo, com este remake que a TV exibiu há muitos anos, às tantas horas da madrugada. É verdade, opa, e, eu, e foi precisamente na TVI que eu o vi, de, 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 provavelmente vimos lo em sintonia, antes do, do, de sequer nos conhecermos, e confesso que, que vi o filme, epá, mas achei o filme muito, epá, muito mauzinho na altura. Uh, e hoje, hoje não tenho uma opinião muito diferente em relação a isso. Agora, não concordo, não sei se concordo contigo, que eh, este seja, ou o filme de 1989, o UFO Abduction, o, o tal vídeo uh, semi-amador uh, que o Dina Liotto realizou, é, se são, serão os primeiros filmes found footage porque epá, eu considero que a trilogia é, em que o, o Holocausto Canibal se insere do Roger Deodato são pois. Epá, de alguma forma os pais Esse, é, esses serão, serão os pais mas, mas, mas ainda, não é, ainda não é não é não sei se podemos considerar 100% found footage porque aquilo só é uma porção do filme não é? se estás lembrado o, o, o Holocausto Canibal é um filme normal e só para aí nos últimos 20 minutos é que entra em modo snuff. Não é snuff, mas é que entra em modo found Sim. footage, não é? Portanto, por isso é que eu digo completo, assim, a 100% found footage, este terá sido dos primeiros. Há uma referência a, uns, a umas espécies de falsos documentários japoneses que são os guinea pigs tem pai umas três ou quatro partes, eu não sei se alguma vez viste isto ou só ouviste não. falar nisto. Não. A malta do, do terror gore e que é fã deste tipo de found footage costuma referenciar esses filmes também como sendo found footage, mas aquilo é um bocado misto de documentário e está dividido em partes, portanto, mais uma vez, não, volta a não ser 100%. Portanto, eu, eu acho que, e até alguém vir aqui uh, dar outro exemplo, Parece-me que este UFO Abduction, ou The McPherson Tapes, um dos, nomes, um dos vários nomes com que isto foi distribuído, será A questão, será a o questão é que existem duas versões do filme. Há uma versão estilo documental de 45 minutos. Estás a falar de, do, do, já da parte do remake, não é? Sim, sim, sim. Do, da, da, do Alien Abduction. Alien Abduction. Isto é um bocado é, confuso há uma porque, parte, porque os há, filmes há, foram há... distribuídos em vários mercados com nomes Exatamente. diferentes. Ele para a televisão foi, foi, foi reeditado com 45 minutos. E tem uma vertente mais documental, com bastantes entrevistas. Depois tens a outra versão, mais longa, que é de 93 minutos, que é sim. então, sim, conhecida como The McPherson Tapes. Títulos à parte, isto, a história é exatamente a mesma. Há uma versão de 89 e há uma versão de 98. A, pri a primeira exatamente. de 89 é uma versão mais low budget, Uh, não teve uma distribuição comercial, por assim dizer. Uh, o, que, o que aconteceu foi que o filme... Foi, foi um filme de escola, vá, basicamente. Basicamente, quase, sim. E que acabou sim. por... por, por uh, o realizador perdeu o rasto ao filme quando os estúdios onde ele tinha feito a edição e tinha as masters originais uh, ardeu. 
Uh, e, o, e, e sobrou um meio dúzia de cópias das quais nem ele tinha, tinha conhecimento uh, e essas cópias começaram-se a disseminar sem ele saber começaram-se a, 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 a disseminar como sendo real e por, isso, <risos> e por isso é que o filme e ele só Sim, usa uns se anos mais tarde se foram encontradas como não sendo um filme não é? exatamente, exatamente. <risos> ainda mais, ainda mais aquilo assustou o pessoal não é? claro, acredito foi só depois de uma carrada de anos que quando ele finalmente teve conhecimento desse, de, 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 desse filme do que o filme dele existia sim e andava a ser circulado como material factual não é como imagens reais é que ele opa calma lá se calhar está na hora de eu reaver os dividendos frente. exatamente e cobrar cobrar o e, valor, isto foi isto era uma altura pré internet não é e, portanto a, a informação não circulava tão depressa como agora e, e depois, depois disso foi-lhe foi -lhe então proposto, e agora já com um orçamento mais, mais generoso, fazer um remake quase cena por cena do que ele tinha feito anteriormente. E a história, a história deste filme é basicamente <risos> uma história perfeitamente banal, ou começa como sendo uma história perfeitamente banal, de uma família aparentemente normal que se reúne para jantar no dia da ação de graças e o filho do meio recebe uma câmara nova e decide registar a reunião de família quando de repente pá, falha a luz e não é que eles são invadidos e abduzidos por extraterrestres eles não chegam a ser abduzidos, calma lá pa pa passa-se tudo na terra <risos> não é? em casa e no quintal e não na sabemos, rua nós não sabemos, nós não sabemos porque... sim, ah, no fi estás a falar já tá, o, não sabemos o que, é que acontece da depois da cassete depois a da parte cassete, da estática é? mas enquanto a cassete está ligada eles andam ali pela casa a correr de um lado para o outro porque são perseguidos, não é? São, há vez umas luzes porque é, aquilo, aquilo que nos é dado a ver, o, a perspectiva, o ponto de vista é, é o de uma cassete que é encontrada na câmara de vídeo e os eventos que ele registou naquela fatídica noite e aqui a história depois para encher o tempo e tornar o produto um, um pouco mais vendável em, em, em outros mercados uh, aqui as sequências em tempo real uh, dessa cassete que é encontrada são entrecortados, de alguma forma, por entrevistas de amigos da família, polícias, cientistas forenses. Para dar um bocadinho mais de credibilidade, não é? Sim, sobre o que aconteceu naquela noite. Eu, eu muito pessoalmente, acho que essa parte das entrevistas quebra um bocadinho alguns momentos de tensão que se vão ali acumulando. Mas também percebo que a nível de, da produção de um filme, se calhar para, depois, para poder mudar de cena, mudar de sequência, mudar de ambiente, se calhar facilita um bocadinho mais a coisa para o... Epá, para eu, eu, a acho que, eu acho que na altura isto era uma coisa tão nova, não é? Vamos passar em televisão uma coisa que parece que... Isto é um, é um pouco quase um déjà vu do Alien Autopsy, porque é, é fones também vendido como sendo... Uma, pá, uma filmagem verdadeira não é? de algo que Sim. aconteceu realmente e, pá, e só passado muitos anos é que os autores vieram dizer é, pá, não senhor, isto foi tudo fabricado mas atenção, atenção que isto é baseado em algo que poderá ter existido é pá, pois só calma que... Aqui, aqui o esquema de marketing não foi bem esse mas, mas pronto, isto foi tele televisionado era como o Jerry, eu acho que isto é mais comparado ao Jerry Springer, não é? O que eu quero Springer, dizer, é? Que eu quero dizer é, 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 o, é o, o, furor, o furor, ou o sururu, que a televisão fez em torno ah, disso. Sim, mas eu, eu, não sei, eu não sei como é que isto foi transmitido na América, eu só sei o que é que vi cá. É pá, e, sim, e... mas para, para terem feito uma versão especialmente para a televisão, foi para explorar ah, ao sim, máximo, sim, não mas é? mas eu acho que o... o, o... Se tu passasses só a K7, eu acho que o público ia ficar um bocadinho tipo, hã? O que é que foi isto, não é? Enquanto que se tu lhe espetares umas Precis, entrevistas pelo meio... De, de corroboração. É, é isso, se tu lhe metes umas entrevistas pelo meio, uns disclaimers, a malta já fica mais uh, ciente do que é que se está a passar, não é? Ou da, menos da banha da cobra Precisavas que Precisavas de um beber. professor Pinto da Costa a dizer, não, não, isto é tudo uma treta. <risos> eu, eu fui, isto, quando deu originalmente cá em Portugal na televisão, pelo menos a primeira vez que eu vi, julgo que acho que deve ter sido a única, Uh, e deve ter sido ao mesmo tempo que tu foi Opa, na, eu foi vi depois... duas vezes eu vi este filme duas vezes na televisão uma um, não uma foi na televisão e foi na TVI e isso eu lembro-me perfeitamente lembro-me ao pai sabes o que é que deu antes 
Não, não, foi... não, porque eu já eu, 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 eu vinha de viagem. Aquilo foi, de viagem. aquilo foi depois de um episódio dos Seres Secretos. Ah, é possível, sim, é possível. E eu tinha, e eu, eu tinha, eu na altura gravava os episódios, porque aquilo dava, dava tarde e era para ver no dia. Tarde. Sim, em 98 ainda, ainda estávamos ali no auge. Eu ainda ia para a escola cedo, não é? Ainda estávamos no auge tinha dos aulas secretos, no dia sim. seguinte. Então eu gravava os episódios e depois via no dia seguinte. E a cassete ficava o resto da noite a gravar e eu... E, e apanhaste o resto. Apanhei o filme todo, aquilo ficou tudo na mesma cassete. E eu lembro-me que antes de ouvir aquilo, eu quando cheguei à escola, a malta estava a falar daquele filme que deu depois dos seres secretos. Que tu não viste, mas tinhas gravado. Eu, exatamente. A malta estava a falar daquilo. Era, o fenómeno foi igualzinho ao Blair Witch. Eles vieram ter comigo, Daniel, tu viste aquilo que deu depois dos seres secretos? A malta estava convencidíssima que tinha visto uma cassete real daquela merda. E quando tu acreditas, o poder daquilo é muito superior, não é? Eu não sou muito mais velho do que tu. Sim. Mas eu na altura achei aquilo uma, uma grande treta. Pois pá. não sei. Não, eu não sei se fui já empurrado pelo fenómeno eu, eu, eu já tinha percebes? Eu já tinha carta, eu já conduzia. E uh, eu vinha Pronto. de uma festa qualquer. Tu já eras e, um homenzinho. E já era um homenzinho, exatamente. Já fazia a barba. Eu não sei, eu talvez tenha sido um bocado influenciado por causa daquela loucura que Sim, na escola de, a malta caiu foste, na. Caiu na foste, foste no, depois, no meio da, da maralhada. O certo é que eu cheguei a casa, vi aquilo, não acreditei, mas fiquei ali com o pé atrás. Será? Percebes? Fiquei ali um bocado naquela cena. Mas eu era um garoto na altura, isto deve ter passado. Fiquei eu um acho que se tu tivesses visto o um episódio merda. seguido. Tu vendo o episódio do Jack Sfalso seguido e vendo o filme, eu acho que tu acreditas em qualquer coisa. Opa, pois, não sei, não sei. Houve ali qualquer coisa que me fez... O Jack Files naquela altura, <risos> tinha o poder de nos fazer acreditar em qualquer coisa. Eu era, eu era puto, pá, eu era puto. Eras um bocadinho mais velho que eu, já eras um homem sabido, já andavas de carro, já, é, se é calhar verdade, já fumavas. É verdade. É verdade. E já tinhas já, preservativos já, no, no tabuleiro é, do carro. É, já engatava umas miúdas, é verdade. <risos> Eu Bem, ainda, não, mas... ainda não tinha chegado lá, pá. <risos> mas em 98, epá, foi, foi o ano quase dos found footage. Isto é, 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 é quase como aquelas notícias quando cai um relâmpago no, em algum sítio. É, parece que na, naquela semana cai relâmpagos em todo lado e não sei o quê. Ah, e, e, e o 98 foi o ano do, do found footage. Começou pois, não, não foi o Blair Witch, só foi no ano seguinte, mas quase, né? Tamo, foi é? Embalado, né? Foi embalado. Começou então com o Alien Abduction. Uh, seguindo-se o The Last Broadcast por, um, epá, por uma questão de meses. Mesmo, sim, mas tu tens isto, isto, este, este Last Broadcast foi comercializado, não é? Foi um filme... Sim, sim, não, eu, eu, eu liguei no videoclube. Ok, sim. Eu lembro-me de o ver, eu, eu, eu liguei, foi um dos filmes que eu liguei no videoclube. Eu acho que nós já falámos nisto quando fizemos sobre o Blair Witch Project, o Blair Witch mas, é mas possível, é possível. reaviva aí a memória sobre o que é que se trata isto. Bem, o, o The Last Broadcast é, epá, é basicamente um, é, é muito similar ao da Blair Witch, é anterior ao Blair Witch, e para mim, eu acho que o Blair Witch de alguma forma baseou-se neste, neste filme, no The Last Broadcast. Uh, aqui uh, a diferença é que é uma equipa de, te de televisão que se embranha numa floresta à procura de provas da existência de um demónio e a coisa obviamente que acaba mal. No ano seguinte então é que temos o tal fenómeno global que foi o Blair Witch Project é pá, hum. muito catapultado pelo poder da internet que estava, pá, estava a abrir estava a, a começar sim. completamente depois houve ali um período em que o found footage caiu em desuso ou sim, não se apostou sim, tanto sim. Foi uma, foi uma tesão do mijo, né? durou ali eu dois ou três sim, anos e depois a coisa Houve aquele assim. fenómeno, mas depois percebeu-se que aquela fórmula era uma fórmula que não tu, era... Tu não, não consegues enganar o público muitas vezes da mesma rapidamente, maneira. É, rapidamente, rapidamente ficou gasta. Mas eu acho que mais recentemente temos alguns exemplos que são uma evolução do found footage e são quase um live on tape. E, epá, e temos vários exemplos como os Paranormal Activities, temos o Cloverfield do Matt Reeves, temos o Chronicle do Josh Trank, e, e uma trilogia que eu, que eu gosto bastante, que é o, o, o Rec, da dupla Jome, Rome, Balagueró e do Paco sim, Plaza. Sim. Uh, epá, que eu sim. Acho, e e, e este sim, eu acho que são uma, uma evolução uh, Mas estes este já, já não se fizeram passar por uma coisa real, não é? Houve essa diferença, já não usaram esse mecanismo de marketing Uh, em, em nos convencer que estávamos a ver uma coisa real Simples, ah, sim, simplesmente ah, deixaram essa o forma, poder essa sim. forma também já está a gasta claro, eu acho que simplesmente inovaram... deixaram, deixaram, deixaram o poder do, do aspecto documental da coisa funcionar e pronto, e pronto não é? eu, eu acho que a evolução aqui para além de técnica 
e de, de orçamento, que isso faz sempre a diferença, é o, o, a fórmula, já não é tanto found footage, mas é live on tape, é quase estar em direto uh, a mostrar aquilo que está a acontecer. Uh, e é aqui um misto, é já, é já quase um híbrido, um elemento híbrido. Tu há bocado falaste no, no Chronicle, não é? É câmaras de vigilância, não é? E há assim uma. Já é uma coisa que não é contínua, já é editada. Sim, é, sim, não é? sim, 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 sim. Eu estou-me aqui a lembrar de um filme de 2007, um bocadinho mais obscuro. Uh, que se chama os The Poughkeepsie Tapes eu não sei se há uma vez visto isto Poughkeepsie? Poughkeepsie Tapes, sim não, é não, nunca ouvi, não, nunca ouvi. Uh, aquilo é, é, é supostamente é, é editado mas é editado a partir das cassetes de arquivo de um psicopata de um serial killer que uh, filmava as vítimas quando as raptava e as coisas que lhes fazia em casa Uh, hum. tinha esse fetiche de se filmar e de colocar as câmaras a, a apanhar as vítimas hum. uh, e, e é um filme um bocado sinistro tenho a dizer, é um found footage também um bocado engraçado, enga é engraçado, acho que está, acho que está bem feito não é, não é assim nada de extraordinário, mas acho que merece essa atenção especialmente porque eu agora quando estive nos Estados Unidos passei de comboio junto à localidade que é Poughkeepsie e eu, opa! Afinal existe. <risos> yes, afinal existe. Afinal existe. Sem mais demoras, vamos então seguir para a entrevista que eu conduzi ao, ao, ao realizador Dean Aliotto. Uh, ele hoje está envolvido aí numa série de outros projetos, todos eles mais ou menos ligados na mesma ao cinema. Mas, é mais documental. É, mais documental. Muita coisa, muita coisa, ele vai explicar. Mas o, o trabalho pelo qual ele há de continuar uh, imortalizado há de ser sempre o... Uh, o Alien Abduction, o original e o remake uh, e vamos então conversar com o homem porque ele, ele sim vai contar a história toda uh, e até à próxima vamos a isso Hello Dean, how are you? I'm very good. How are you, Daniel? Okay, thank you for having for share a little bit of your time with us. I think we can start uh, with the the original one from 1989, but uh, actually the one I have seen was the the remake. And the, the first time was probably on 98 or 99 when I saw saw it for the first time. I remember it was a pre Blair Witch project because I had no other big reference from a found footage movie. Was this made to be like real footage, like Blair Witch was? Or it was intended to be perceived as real? Yeah, well, there's several versions of, of the answer to that. The conspiracy mm -hmm. theorist will tell you that, that um, I work for the government and that <laughs> um, I was part of some disinformation. Some of them believe that the remake is fake and that I used it to throw off people from the original UFO abduction. The other conspiracy theories, um, theorists believe that um, that one was also real. And so it was this kind of thing that, um, that uh, I've been hired supposedly by the government to create these as part of some big disinformation campaign. Um, Were you? I, well, that <laughs> I can't really tell you because, you know. You would have to kill me. Yeah, yeah. Or have you sign an NDA or have the men in black come and get you? I don't know. But um, basically, uh, yeah, so it, it was something that, um, uh, I mean, if we, if we talk about like the original, the, the impetus for the original was that I needed to make my first film before I turned 25 because all of my filmmaking idols have. And, and so with only 6,500 bucks to my name, um, I went ahead and, and made basically a home video. And I thought, you know, because that's the only thing I can afford. This is before DSLR cameras and, and how cheap it's become. Um, it was very expensive to shoot 16 millimeter, which was the only other format at the time for shooting movies. And so I thought, well, I'll shoot it on video and it'll be a home video, but it'll be a home video where something, you know, fantastical happens and I'll capture it and it'll all be done in one take. Um, hmm. And so uh, it would be recorded from a family member's home video, very much like the remake. And so... That kind of started everything is, is me needing to make my first film and doing it. Um, and the, and the, the brief story behind that is that the, the film actually got distributed, the video. Um, but the distribution company a few months later burned to the ground, literally. And so I lost my main master and all my artwork. And uh, I thought, well, that's it. Time to move on. Um, I, you know, what, what am I going to do? 
And so I, I move on with my career and I'm directing on this crime series and I get a call from this guy saying that, um, that um, <clears throat> wanting to know um, who found this footage. And I, it was the first time I heard the term found footage. And so uh-huh. he, he said, well, I don't know if you know what's been going on, but a copy of your video has been circulating around the UFO community for five years. And it's huh. ended up at the International UFO Congress Convention. And you where, thought it was lost, right? Well, I, I, I had like my original tapes that I shot it on, but my edited mm. master um, and color corrected and, and everything else was, was gone. And so was all my artwork. So I literally just walked away from it and I wasn't going to try to re-release it. It was kind of, you know, a sad experience. I just wanted to move on with my career. And so um, when, um, yeah, so, so basically someone much more clever than I am circulated around the UFO community, again, without the credits. So it ends up being considered to be true. A, a lieutenant colonel and, and a UFO researcher <clears throat> both claimed it was authentic. And, oh. uh, and so... <laughs> Unsolved Mysteries was trying to to cover the story and wanted to to do it. And then another show called um, Hard Copy and then finally a show called Encounters for Fox wanted to do a segment on it. So I did that segment. And um, as this, you know, UFO, you know, uh, hoax, Mm -hmm. one of the one of the big UFO hoax and the guy who produced it and was actually um, um, the guy who who set up the whole thing at Fox's Encounter show went on to produce Alien Autopsy in Silent Lake County two years later. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so Bob, Bob Kiviet is his name, Robert Kiviet. And so um, anyway, I you know did this thing, and then all of a sudden I started getting all these um, um, fan mail and then getting calls in the middle of the night from Brazil, from Germany, all these people saying, I need to have a copy of this movie. And I said, it's not you know this documentary. And I would say, <clears throat> it's not a documentary. It's it's, you know, a student project, pretty much <laughs> first film. Yeah. And um, they would have none of that. They just wanted to see it for their own eyes. And, and so fine. So I, you know, would send it out and then um, flash forward another couple of years. And I'm working on this crime series. And the head writer, Paul Chitlick, said um, that he believed he could sell it as a TV movie. And so we ended up um, hooking up with Dick Clark Productions and making it at UPN as their first TV movie. So that's kind of how the whole thing, uh, you know, came yeah, about okay. again. And, and yes, I wanted to make my first film, but I also had read the book Communion around that time, the Whitley Street uh-huh. book. And Another uh, one that gave a movie, right? Yes. There's a movie with uh, Christopher Walken, I guess. Christopher I think Walken. It, yeah. yeah. Never and saw so it. it was, it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, though Whitley is not too happy with it. But so, so what happened was uh, I had read the book and I thought I really want to show what it would be like real time to be abducted and i want to adhere to all of the um the uh stages of, of abduction that are claimed to happen by people mm-hmm. who've been abducted so i want it to be the most authentic thing and put you right in it and so i thought a documentary format would work best for that and i thought well i'll just fake it i had zero idea that i was doing one of the first found footage films of all time and starting yes. this thing. so that was kind of a secondary you know, thing that, that came out of it, which was a nice, um, you know, thing to be okay. a part of. Uh, still speaking about the first one, uh, you casted all the actors like a normal movie? No, we did a casting like, like a normal film, but we, we skewed it more towards improvisational actors. So we reached mm-hmm. out to them specifically, and, um, and that yield, yielded us um, some really, really um, great actors like Tommy Giovaccini, who plays uh, uh, Eric, the older brother, and um, mm-hmm. and also Shirley McCullough, who plays the mother. In fact, when Shirley came to the audition, she um, told her own UFO story, which actually oh, cool. happened yeah. to her. And she told it so great. I mean, you can learn as a director, you can learn much more, I think, from an actor by asking them to tell you a story than you can by auditioning them mm-hmm. because they're they're exposing themselves. They're they're um, giving you the shades of who they are as a personality. Whereas when they're interpreting something, they're not really sure Mm -hmm. what angle to go, but but they're sure about being themselves and telling the story. So she told this great story. It was very fun and entertaining. And, you know, needless to say, she got the job. There's that that, uh, very cute picture with three girls uh, in the alien suits. How the thing... 
how do you direct these kids to be aliens on your first movie? Well, aliens um, are able to communicate telepathically, so I just had to go like this, and they knew exactly where to stand and where to oh. go. <laughs> um, okay. It was uh, basically doing the blocking, doing the walkthrough, and then and because I was actually playing the, the kid, Michael, who was recording the whole um, mm -hmm. abductions, um, I had a headset on, and so I was cueing my um, assistant directors and saying, get this ready get this ready, we're coming out, you know, so I would quietly do that. And, and, it's, and if you listen to the movie carefully, especially when, when I'm walking down the hallway to ch check on this alien that's in the other room, you can hear a little bit of the headset and me cueing things. So <laughs> working, yeah, so wor <laughs> working with the aliens was my, um, my uh, ex-wife, and she was, um, it was her job to corral the aliens and make sure they moved on cue and everything. So she gets mm -hmm. uh, props for that and, and, So we did a few different takes as they came down, you know, to make sure that we had it right. You know, all of that mm -hmm. was worked out beforehand in prep. So it was pretty much, you know, let's see what we get and then roll the camera. Okay. How did the actors react to all, all the, that story of the movie uh, being shared as a real thing? Yeah, I reached out to them um, uh, because when we first sold it, we were able to get um, – we got enough money to pay off our um, – our deferments that we had. And so um, I paid those off. And when I reached out to them, um, they were uh, they were all surprised. In fact, a Japanese company, inscrupulous Japanese production company, came out to interview me and they wanted to interview the youngest uh, uh, cast member, which was the, the five-year-old girl who was mm -hmm. now many years later was grown up. They wanted to interview her and interview um, Tommy, who plays Eric. The older brother and so they interviewed them and then i got interviewed separately and then i get a call and tommy says to me that was a crazy you know interview and i go what are you talking about and he says they wanted me to pretend uh, okay that, that it, i was it was real okay. that it was real and i felt i was kind of um i won't i won't curse but it was, it was bs i was really pissed off that they had done that and didn't tell them and and see the balance for me has been i'm a big fan of the genre I'm kind of an amateur UFOologist, if you will, ufologist. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, I'm protective of that. But at the same time, as a filmmaker, I thrive on being able to create new narratives, being able to show people a story presented in a way that's, you know, what the French would call cinema verite, but in a way that's unconventional, but is raw and really hits them. And so I wasn't intending to be deceiving to the point of editing off credits and interjecting it. Mm -hmm. It was... I'm trying to create an experience for an audience of what this would be like. The fact that it, that it was in that format made it very easy to be co-opted. And if I had been more you know, intelligent about it, I would have known, well, this is a possibility that, that could happen. But I didn't know about the UFO community, and I didn't know that there's a fringe of the community that jumps on conspiracies and creates, actually creates conspiracies. Let's talk about the remake a little bit more. Um, what was the biggest uh, challenges uh, you had with this, with this incident in Lake County version? Uh, spending the uh, one point, it ended up being about $1.6 million uh, mm -hmm. for the budget. That was okay. stressful because I did the original for sixty five hundred. In fact, uh, let so me. It just, shouldn't be hard. Uh, it is. You wouldn't think so, but but since I had done the original for sixty five hundred, um, and again in my mind, I did. I never appreciated um, the films. I thought it was kind of a, a a gimmick and a vehicle in which to kind of have people again see what this would be like. And so I just thought it was this strange thing. That would get out there and then maybe a few people would see it and that would be it. So the fact that it caught on and even the, the, um, the head of the network who were all giddy and excited about it, I kept saying, why don't we just show the original? I've already done that. I don't need to redo this. And they were mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. We're going to do it on a bigger scale, blah, blah, blah. Well, I think that that kind of detracted. The original had a lot of rawness, a lot of, um, you know, talking over people, stuff like that, that the second one didn't because it was all scripted mm -hmm. um the actors looked a little better looking than in my original uh they were equally talented and it's better shot i think it looks clearer at least yeah in right? that regard but as far as selling the authenticity 
of this d- documentary. Um, mm-hmm. You want it to look raw. But um, anyway, so it was like, OK, I've got I've got, you know, we've been told we have one point two five million, but we're shooting in Vancouver. So that means that that's going to be more like one point five million. X Files land. <laughs> yeah, and so well, speaking of the X Files, I thought, yeah. all right, well, let's get the guys from the X Files to do the ship and aliens. That'll oh. blow through some money. But the person who did the ship, his name is Clyde Klotz, and he was um, he actually was married to Gillian Anderson, and they had a, a child, Piper. Uh, oh my together. god! <laughs> yeah. So it was this weird thing, and, and he had just, I think they had gone through their divorce right after I showed up and worked with him. And he was great. He created this ship that was amazing looking. And then mm-hmm. we got Tony Landala, who did all the special ah, effects. Ah, yeah, that's the guy, who the, the special, yeah, the practical all the one. Effects. Yeah. effects, yeah. yeah. And so he did the aliens for the kids and did the hands. Um, and, Probably uh, reusing suits from the show, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, I hope not. Um, well, the problem was the hands were these big, huge clown hands that drooped down. And it was made of silicone. And so when the aliens walked, the little girls walked, it was like rubbery. It looked ridiculous. Uh-huh. And so yeah, we yeah. had to... I think so, the aliens on Close Encounters from Spielberg have the same problem. Now that I've seen the movie recently in 4K, yeah. and the aliens walked at this and they're like... Wee, wee, wee. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty it's, obvious. It's, uh, yeah. So we got rid of those. And then I went to the uh, onset paramedic and I said, look, do you have any surgical gloves? And we put those white gloves on the kids. And that's how we kind of did a, a, a low-end remedy for that. Um, mm-hmm. the silicone that they used, there's two kinds of silicone. One is a little more toxic than the other and, um, a little stronger in the fumes. And that was making the actors, the young kids sick. And so we had to, um, we didn't discuss. So it's kids again. Kids again. Yeah. You're using kids again. Okay. Because the bodies, um, need to be, um, slight androgynous. They need to be, um, shorter. And so, um, Thin. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we use girls again, uh, At that age, you know, where they're like eight or nine, they tend to have this kind of, um, you know, um, lanky, very thin, silhouette almost, you know, body frame. So anyway, mm-hmm. we, um, we got those guys. And then instead of shooting in one night, we shot it in five nights. But we still came in 500,000 under budget. Okay. So, it was shot chronologically? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All shot chronologically. Yeah. We broke it up okay. into 20-minute segments. So it was all done. You know, each night. Okay. Um, when was the last time you saw you saw the movie? The movie. I'm I'm just asking this because I'm going to ask you uh, if it still holds up for you. Did you see the one or two hour version? Ah, uh, yeah. That's an uh, that's another question. I know there's a lot of versions. The the one I saw it have interviews with the cast with the the actors. Those kind of documentary thing. Is that the main difference between? Both? Well, no. They, they both have that one has fake documentary um or, or fake experts that's the mm-hmm. one i did um the one that is the shorter version which is the hour version mm-hmm. they brought in actual ufo experts uh like oh, okay. uh, dr stan friedman and they, and they brought would in... pretend that they were trying to debunk something is that what they did no <clears throat> no um dr stan friedman and yvonne smith and um <clears throat> Daryl Sims and a few other people, they were brought in to just talk about abductions and UFOs so that they could intercut. The producers could sneak in, the new producers who came in, could sneak in and intercut their interview with the footage so it looked like they were commenting on the footage, which was real BS. Ah, okay. Can I can I swear or no? Yeah, don't... you can. Yeah, it's it, right. even in Portuguese, it's very, uh, it doesn't Except sound the... so harsh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, what's a Portuguese word for bullshit? Uh, it was real bullshit uh, that they did yeah. this because it was, um, you know, it, it was deceiving. It was deception. And that's, to me, where I draw the line. That was when it crossed mm-hmm. over. And so the, how that whole thing came about um, is that while we were shooting the movie, the, the TV movie, everyone at UPN, the network, was fired. And so when we came back, I was forced to do a final cut in two weeks. Mm-hmm. which is insane to do. And I had to have yeah. special effects and everything. So I turned it in and the new regime um, looked at the footage and thought, oh my God, what a piece of shit. Let me get this straight. You guys shot with no name actors. You shot digital. What's digital? You shot all handheld, 20 minute takes. Thank God we're here to save the network. So they brought <laughs> in this woman to come in and cut it down to an hour. 
And then she added her own interviews into it, but used all of our footage. And then she redid the special effects where the ball is going around, which was much worse. The original one was so much better. Um, the other one looked like a lens flare and was anyway, uh-huh. was weak. And so, um, so that version is not, I don't consider it to be the best version. The best version is the two hour version where there's no music. It's raw. It plays out. Um, and so if you can get your hands on that I one. I think it was that one that I saw. It, it has been 20 years. Good. I'm in that one. My hair yeah. is all this length. Yeah, I know. I don't remember seeing you on the movie, but I know that you were there, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so I was one of the experts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we had fun with that. So that's kind of the marker if you're trying to, you know, if, it, if I'm in that one, that's the long version. So I've not seen it in years. There's another film called Holocaust, uh, wait, Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, Cannibal Holocaust, yes. From Rogero Diodato, yeah. Yes. Now, the experts, if you will, in the found footage field are saying, well, that's not a found footage film. Because their film is like Spinal Tap in that it's, here's this crew and this footage that we found, and we're going to show you this footage. And so the story's about these guys investigating it and presenting the footage so it doesn't adhere to Here's this footage that was found unedited, uncut. We're going to yeah, let it play. It has a, a, a normal movie segment. So it's a, technically, I guess, a quasi-documentary, which mine yeah. is found footage. It's, it's not a documentary. 100%, percent, yeah. So there, so that was um, something that was pointed out to me, and I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm glad. I, you know, I, I, for yeah. me, I'm focusing on what I'm doing now and kind of not too much on the past. And so I'd kind of forgotten about all of that and let it go. And then when I started getting calls to do podcasts and stuff from a yeah, lot of like people like you. like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, their age, you grew up and we're like, I need to talk to the guy who did this thing. Because either, you know, some of them, they still sleep with the lights on or it got them interested in sci-fi horror or found footage, period. And so at, at first I would apologize because I would get emails saying, you know, I had this one woman that said she was pregnant and she almost had a miscarriage. Ah, and, And then, and, but, but the bulk of them were a lot of kids who were like eight and nine and 10 and they were scared shitless. And yeah. I thought, well, it's parents, how irresponsible. I wouldn't show my daughter, you know, <laughs> this, but, but they all said the same thing. No, I loved it. It scared yeah. the hell out of me, but it, but it got me, um, you know, into it and I love it. And so these guys track all this stuff. So I appreciate, you know, stumbling into this thing and I appreciate the, the ripple effect uh-huh. it's had. Uh, but by the way, how did you? Um, because you sh- the first one you shot in what year? Eighty nine, eighty eight. I think we shot in eighty eight and released okay. in eighty uh, nine. So how did you got that nineties n- alien look? The gray one with the big eyes and everything. Because I I always felt that l- alien look was a, th- a product from the nineties, not before. Yeah. Where did you got that look? If you look back at two movies specifically um one is a tv movie and one is a, a feature film you can see shades of what this character looks like one is called the ufo incident um which was about barney and betty hill uh uh-huh, okay the original um, by, abduction yeah. couple story thing from the 60s i think yeah james earl jones played the husband and estelle parsons played the wife it was an interracial couple who had their a UFO abduction experience. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was 1975. So, and they had little kids or little people play them and they had kind of big heads and and, um, bald heads and, you know, big shaped eyes. And then when Spielberg did Close Encounters in 77, Mm -hmm. it it also had that. And then when I read... um, The eyes uh, were a little bit different, but yeah, the the main look was alien. They were. Gray, gray alien. But... Yeah, but if you look at the, the – and I think it was 87 when uh, Communion came out. Mm-hmm. If you look at that alien, which is the typical almond-shaped eyes and, and the head and everything, mm-hmm. that became – that refined a look that had already been established. Yeah. And so it became – now it's all about the big black eyes. And so because that had just come out, it seemed like that was more relevant. And so I had co-opted that. And so what's interesting so is that in the, the 90s – You're part of it. You're part of the conspiracy. Well, what's interesting is that in the – um. In the 90s, that's when it became household. Yeah. It became this brand. And I remember at the time going... The X-Files also got it, also got that, uh, that thing, yeah. that look. 
Exactly. And so I remember the time going, wow, we had done some of the first, but now everyone's co-opted it. And it's in stickers. It's on this and that. It's being branded all over. And I thought yeah. I probably should have thought bigger about what I was doing. If there was a bigger <laughs> potential here. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And I have to be honest with you. Ever since I was a kid. Now I'm a little bit more skeptic. I don't believe everything like I did when I was a kid. And I, w I was devouring every documentary I could find about aliens. Not today. Because History Channel, he's all about aliens 24, oh hour, my God. 24 yeah. hours a day. So, But at the time, it was rare. Uh, and that it was always the aliens, the thing that got me more nervous and scared. So there's something about that figure thing. Um, it's primal. I don't know why. Right? It's because it looks like a skeleton. I don't know. There's something about that, that figure. Well, it looks like a little ghost. It looks yeah. like Casper the ghost. There's something... In fact, kids who claim to have been had experiences or adults that they'll flash back to to um, yeah. having memories of telling their parents that the little ghosts are coming to visit me. Yeah. You know, and they'll draw pictures that look like skeletons, exactly like you're saying. Dean, do you envy the Blair Witch Project success? Do you like the movie? I have little voodoo dolls of the creators of those films that I stick pins into every night and say, <laughs> damn you, damn you. Um, yeah. I I feel like I my biggest regret is that I underestimated my own film, mm. um, which which you can't say because there's something better about something going um, kind of um, um, underground and slowly building and people finding out about it instead of just being out there. There's more of a mystery. So the, the story of my movies became more of a mystery as they unfolded and people, you know, became this cult thing. That's that's interesting. The Blair Witch guys. Yeah, I wish I thought to send my film to film festivals. I just I literally thought it was a gimmick. I thought it was just this kind of weird, strange thing that was, again, get me to make my first film, but also to kind of, you know, show people who were interested. Because I don't know how many people like UFOs. So I thought mm. it was a very specific thing at the time. Yeah, it was a more niche thing. It really was. And so even when the remake happened, it was still kind of niche. Yeah. And then it and then it really, you know, kicked in. But um, no, I'm I I'm envious that they did that. And I, they did a lot of things better than I did. Um, you know, there's some things they didn't do quite as as good as it came. Every time someone makes a film footage film, someone that really puts into it like the paranormal films. Mm -hmm. They added a lot to it. The sound design on the paranormal films, especially the first one, is just wicked awesome. It's like great. And so there's certain things that, that get added on to they that are better. They learn. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell us about your new project of yours? Alien Content? It's How is it called? Yeah, Alien Content. What's that? Yeah. Um, so it's funny. When I connected with Alejandro Rojas, who runs the International UFO Congress Convention in... Um, and um, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, as soon as we had connected, and the idea was me to come out for the 25th anniversary and show the film that kind of caused that uproar, you know, in, in 93 at the convention, um, there were certain things that I started realizing. It was kind of like I look back at my life, and, and it was kind of like this weird memoir where I look back and I was going over all my stuff because I had to do a 75 minute lecture, which I'd never done before. So I had to pull together all of this material and from pictures and everything. And so I was going back in time a little bit. And then I realized that a third of my IP, my intellectual property, all the scripts that I've created, you know, the 30 scripts and like six pilots and stuff, that a third of them are all sci-fi alien related. And so I kind of went, oh, well, that's interesting. It's obviously something that wasn't just that film. It wasn't a one-off. It's something that is part of the the way that I like to tell stories. And You're so, typecasted. <laughs> yeah, and I and I and as much as I had kind of at first was distancing myself from the films because of all the controversy and craziness, I started to appreciate it from a, a new perspective. And I realized I love working in this space, and I have before. And so maybe what I should do is consolidate that and create a new film venture, a uh, production company, if you will, that just does that, that just does sci-fi alien stuff. And so I formed this company, and I have about six films on the slate that I want to do. One of them is a documentary that I'm starting to shoot at this um, convention 
Um, I've also been doing a behind the scenes documentary of me going to the the International UFO Congress convention for the anniversary because I'm I'm doing this big documentary of the behind the scenes and how the original movie came about. So I have that that whole kind of my own story. And then I have a separate one that's a documentary that's about alien abductions and where, you know, UFOs are purported to come from. So that's a separate legit doc that um, Nick Pope is going to be um, in that documentary and a few other uh, experts. And so that's kind of what I'm working on now. And I'm about to shoot um, a horror movie this summer mm-hmm. um, called Portal. And uh, so that's Sorry, next on DB. Yeah, so that's next uh, coming up. We start shooting in a couple weeks if we can lock the location, um, which is always a challenge for these, you know, haunted house type movies. Mm-hmm. This is not found footage, by the way. So, okay. <laughs> but it's but, still um, sh- shot on Vancouver, the horror land, right? I, I no, it's this like is every shot, horror movie in Vancouver. Yeah, exactly. This this will be shot locally in Los Angeles, um, and so um, that's what I'm doing next. And then I did a political thriller. A year ago that um, we are hopefully prepping to get released. Um, that one is shot like a documentary. So that's a little bit of a hybrid type. If someone uh, wants to see your original movie, where people can see it? They can see it at um, www.ufoabductionmovie.com. It's mm-hmm. been completely remastered. Uh, I went back to the original source tapes. And then I also put on the DVD a behind the scenes from the Fox show that I did. So you can see all how it all came about and and mm-hmm. and, um, and all was all put together. It's a really pristine copy of the film um, that you can either buy as a DVD or you can di- do a digital download. Okay, perfect. What about the remake? Is it uh, online? Somewhere? The remake, I don't own the rights to. Oh, damn. But if you go on YouTube, there's still people that are... <laughs> that, yeah. I think have clips or, or some of it there. I'd like to get it released, and someday, yeah. um, hopefully, we will. It should be meantime, a dual, dual release with the remake and the original. It should be. Like oh, I would love to set. have one master yeah. like two disc set. Yeah. <laughs> Dean, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Okay. Have fun. Bye bye. Ciao.